CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Jonah Bronstein of Bronstein Sports Plus. Uh, since we spoke last, has uh, the portfolio at Bronstein Sports Plus grown at all? It has not, but okay. as we mentioned a week ago, uh, not shrinking is the goal, and we continue to maintain the same sphere of influence week to week. That's, that's all you can ask for, really. Um, I am trying to produce work for The Athletic, and uh, I wanted to share some of the uh, research that I've been... I don't know why I just had a brain cramp right there. Maybe I need more coffee, even though we are recording this at 4 o'clock. Um. Yeah. You're supposed to fill in oh, that. But I mean, uh, yeah, magic of editing. We could just go back and <laughs> punch in the word there and move along. <laughs> right. When I produce this uh, later, when I go and uh, uh, go into the software that I use uh, to, to turn this uh, Zoom call into a YouTube uh, video and a podcast, uh, I see the, um, you know, the, the soundtrack. And there's just going to be a big blank, a couple of blanks right there where my brain did exactly that. It stopped uh, the syn synapses, uh, just stopped firing there. We played this game last night where I tried to guess the word that you were thinking of, and I got it, but I think it was on like the 14th guess. Right. I don't know if we had time to do that again here. That was, yeah, that happens to me more and more. I think it's just being 52 and uh, maybe some other things going on in my life too. Um especially things that happen after 10 p.m. Um, or by the way, do we going to get together at Elmo's again tonight? Uh, it depends. It depends on, I, I, to be honest, probably not. I got a big game to cover and a big story to write, and we'll see uh, how late into the night that takes me and, and how I feel. And I'm in the load management stage of my career where I don't know if I can do better. <laughs> I back. think I should be. That's. I think I'm supposed to be and this, uh, the start of this podcast is, uh, exhibit Z. Yeah. At least the Sabres, I didn't have to write about any goals that they scored last night. So that's conserved a little bit of my energy. I don't even want to talk about the Sabres on this podcast. That doesn't mean that we won't, but I have no interest in it. The, the whole back and forth. Yeah. They score seven goals. They go from their greatest shutout victory in years to one of their worst shutout losses, especially the stat that you came up with. It is the most shots in Sa is it Sabres history? The yeah, most shots in a in a shutout. Yeah. There were most shots without 42. scoring. 45 last night. The record before that was 42, the dubious record. And the opposing goaltender the last time that happened with 42 shots was Craig Anderson playing for Ottawa in 2013, I believe that was. A week ago, the Sabres set their team record for most shots in a game, only scoring one goal. So they had some pretty remarkable, historically significant, poor shooting nights. And in both those games, I think they played decently in many ways, but they've had an inability to score of you know, franchise record proportions two weeks in a row now at home. I think something serious is going to have to happen for me to care uh, about the Sabres again. And that means it could be a five game losing streak it could be a five game winning streak it could be a coaching change it could be a trade i mean something is going to have to happen to cajole me uh into 
uh, giving a shit uh, about well, you, what's going on over there because it's just so numbing. Yeah, you watched them score seven goals the other night, went seven to nothing, and I don't think you uh, cracked a smile at any point. <laughs> or you know, and Maybe that's how you're supposed to, but I, you didn't really show much uh, interest in, in anything that they were producing that night. Are you were you watching me or the game? What no, were you watching? I, I think I'm more reacting to at the end of the night. And I was a little bit in the same boat. Um, you know, they just went seven nothing, and neither one of us were in a big hurry to go down. No, was standing at their stall at the locker room, ready to face the music. And you know, when I go to the Sabres games, uh, just for people listening, uh, my seat is next to Jonah's. So Jonah and I. We'll sit and compare notes. I'm actually in between Jonah and Matthew Fairburn in the press box. So I sit in your seat when you're not there. I'm sorry. I, I sit in your seat every game that you're not there. I, I sidle over to Matthew Fairburn. He's got the second screen technology that's quite useful. It's one seat closer to center ice. I get it. It's not a bad seat. Um I want to talk about the Bills. Super Bowl parade. And that's what I was getting at at the beginning of the podcast. Uh, it was a story that I worked on for five days. I started doing interviews last Thursday and I got some great information, some great Intel as to what the parade route would be. Probably don't know for sure uh, because nothing's been finalized and things like that don't get hammered out until it's pretty close to uh, being a, a reality. So it's all hypothetical at this point, but talking with people who know and planners, people who've had preliminary discussions about it. I then went up and down the route and talked to business owners, um, Mike Schatzel, uh, the owner of Coulter Bay, which is right there at the corner of Delaware and Allen. It would be a prime location. Uh, I spoke with a delightful couple uh, who works in the kitchen at Sidelines, which is the only sports bar uh, on the Delaware route. Uh, I spoke with New Era and Delaware North, uh, companies that are involved in championship parades in other cities because of their businesses. Uh, but would have the parade going right past their hometown headquarters, which is pretty cool. Uh, and the story was canceled, and rightfully so. It had to be canceled with what happened in Kansas City. Uh, the shootings uh, latest uh, today is that two juveniles have been charged with the crime. Uh, they have not been uh, named, I don't even think their ages have been released yet as uh, as um, they determine whether or not uh, these kids are going to be tried as adults. But uh, several people shot, at least one dead. And I, the reason I say at least is because people are still injured. I don't know to, the, to what degree, if, if people may still die from the wounds. There were some, at least at one point, critically injured. Um, so I'm speaking uh, in vague terms there, but all the interviews that I did for this story that was going to be fun talked about how fun it was going to be to be amid this chaos, not only for the parade, but the night the Bills were to win their championship or the Sabres for that matter. People talking about cars being overturned uh, for fun and hey, that's the price that you pay. And yes, it's you know, people are going to get crazy and smash out a store window or maybe loot a gas station uh, convenience store. And there's going to be some fist fights and some crazy stuff, but it's all in the name of uh, fun and championships. And of course, the whole tenor of that story changes uh, when there's an actual tragedy and, um, Anyways, it was just uh, one of those things. Uh, you know, you work on a story, and the timing of it was, you know, it, the the tragedy takes precedence over over the rest of it. And so, I don't know if what discussion there is to be had there, really, but I just wanted to explain um, 
that it's uh, it was I was working on a pretty fun story, and it's it's not so delightful anymore. I'd have to go recast all the interviews. Uh, you know, the people who I interviewed were reaching out to me the day of the you know and saying, you know, uh, you know, they wanted to take their words back, of course, because the the, the whole perception that the the whole everything's changed with with what you when you think of or give get a chuckle uh of championship celebrations that you see around the world of course western new york hasn't experienced them but when the philadelphia eagles won the world series or uh, excuse me when the philadelphia the philadelphia phillies have somewhat recently won the world series but when the philadelphia eagles won the super bowl and they had their parade in February 2018, $273,000 worth of property and equipment damage to the city. Two people were stabbed, two assaults, a police officer assaulted, four police vehicles sustained minor damage. They had to clean up 60 tons of trash afterwards. The parade cost $2.3 million uh, with the city picking up most of the tab the state kicking in half a half a million uh and the Philadelphia Eagles picking up the tab on the $273,000 worth of damage um but there was looting torn down traffic lights outside of city hall assaults vandalism there was that guy infamously eating horse shit you know walking behind in a the guy was in a Randall Cunningham jersey and Zubes you know, a kindred spirit to the Buffalo Bills fan, so excited about winning the Super Bowl that he said he was going to eat the this clump that just came out of the back of a mounted uh, policeman. Well, his horse anyway, not him. But all that stuff, we laugh about it. And now it's not so adorable anymore. I don't know. I don't know where there is to talk about that or if you have any thoughts, but. I think my main thought is mostly that I think it's two different spectrums or two different storylines. I think the gun violence and the proliferation of mass shootings and the different settings where maybe it doesn't feel safe anymore or there's fear and terrorism, if you will, induced by mass shootings. And now that's touched on a sports championship parade is one part of it and the different looting and different types of violence and different types of security issues that might occur on a Bills championship parade. Um, as you mentioned, that was a bit more of a fun, at least it's somewhat lighthearted. You, you make fun of Bills mafia and the way they uh, stereotypically behave at a Bills game. And you kind of imagine, I think I've even seen somebody's done some AI art of the carnage that, might exist if the Bills championship parade was walking the streets of Buffalo. Um, but it, it, yeah, it just seems like a more serious and not at all lighthearted conversation to have when you talk about gun violence and shootings and, and things that have happened most recently at this parade in Kansas City, but far too frequently in many different places in many different states and cities throughout the United States in recent years. Yeah, there's been gunfire, uh, or at least reported gunfire or confirmed gunshots at other recent championship parades. Um, but this is the first time that, uh, at least as far as I know, that somebody uh, was killed, at least in my research. I couldn't find any other instances where, um, you know, obviously somebody was shot to death. Um, so... Yeah, it was it was a shame because I was I was enjoying writing this. Uh, I was enjoying working on the story, uh, did a lot of research. Uh, and so just so people would know, I, I, at least this is the way it would probably go. The city has the final say on this, uh, of course, because it has to do with how much you're, it's going to cost. And the cities generally are on the hook for such events for the parade it's not like the bills just pay for this parade now some teams have done that the la rams i believe paid for theirs um but let me give you some price tags so the chiefs parade was budgeted at 2.3 million dollars 1.3 million was going to come from the chiefs or sponsors 
you know, so whatever the official beer or the official car dealership of, of the Kansas city chiefs probably kicking in some things, but the rest of it, uh, was going to be picked up by the government, um, shuttles, equipment, rental, police, overtime, extra security, event management, medical, uh, a hundred thousand dollars for insurance alone. Now I knew of these numbers before the shooting. Uh, so the idea of a hundred thousand dollars for insurance sounds steep. Now it doesn't seem, uh, expensive enough. It seems like a, a damn bargain, hundred thousand dollars for, for insurance on the event, $29,000 just for decorations. And teams generally just contribute to it. Um, when the, and basketball and hockey parades are cheaper. Uh, the nuggets, when they won the championship, uh, it cost $900,000 Cronky sports and entertainment, uh, picked up uh, most of it, I believe, or, or no, I'm sorry. I'm looking at my numbers here. 440,000 taxpayers paid for 300,000 for that one. Um, the 2018 Washington capitals, that was their first title. So you think having went winning it the first time, maybe that changes things as opposed to having won the, th the second or third, when you've won your first championship, the capitals parade cost only $400,000. So it's a little bit different when it comes to um, the sports. Now the 2017 warriors, that was their second parade that reportedly cost $4 million. That was, that's the one that was paid for by the entire team. The golden state warriors picked up the tab, uh, the entire $4 million paid for, um, by the team. And that was their second one. So I'm not sure what their first one was. Uh, but anyways, um, the the bills based on my research and talking to people who know the bills parade for the record um would probably start at gate circle and head south into the city and onto the steps of city hall um there were some people that thought that it would only go from north uh to uh city hall which would be the invert route or the inverse route of uh the saint patrick's day parade but that parade would be dwarfed by whatever uh the bills would would churn out you'd have people coming from all over you wouldn't just have bills uh people from western new york you couldn't just base the uh the forecast of the attendance on the population you'd have people coming from the carolinas from florida all these transplants and expats you know they would be coming back so they could witness this victory parade you know would it be a million the the cleveland cavaliers when when they won a championship for cleveland that rare cleveland championship they had 1.3 million people in 2016 of course that's when the weather's nicer uh that that impacts things also um the 2019 Raptors, 2 million estimate. Um, anyways, uh, these are more people, by the way, according to a website I found that tracks uh, mass mass attended events, more people than Princess Diana's funeral, the Billy Graham crusade, and Pope John Paul, uh, re, uh, in his, him being uh, named a saint. Um, that's a lot of people. And so the belief being that you couldn't just use the St. Patrick's Day route because to accommodate all the people, you'd need to disperse them and you would need to go further up Delaware North to go past all those mansions uh, and pretty close to Forest Lawn Cemetery where several thousand people uh, died before they could see a Bills championship. So perhaps appropriate uh, that it would start there. Um can I ask you if you're reporting on the, the parade plans, how long has that been in place? Does that go back to the nine? None of it's in place. It's all theoretical because that, but it's believed to be, if that were to take place, that is how it would go. So again, I keep saying, you know, that there's been discussions. Uh, I reached out to members of the uh, Buffalo Sabres uh, front office from 1999 and even though that reached game six, uh, there were no plans in place even at, for, for that parade. Um, the Bills 
even though they reached the AFC championship game a few years ago, it's still, it was like basic conversations or, uh, you know, just really, you know, sketching things out. So there really has not been a, an actual route cemented in place, but that's what's believed by people who are educated on the topic that is believed to be what would have to happen. Now, if there'd be the weather, would you have to clear snow? You'd have to get the cars off the road. Delaware North is a narrow road. It's not like a Canyon of Heroes situation in New York City where you can go down a narrow road and have all the people in the buildings looking down on it. Um, if you're going to accommodate the fans, you'd have to. And, and I think that obviously you stop at the steps of City Hall. You have the team up on risers. Uh, you or the balconies, uh, just as you did when Lindy Ruff screamed no goal, and just as uh, what happened when the fans chanted "We want Scott" after a wide right. So that's the natural location. That's the the natural destination. So now you just need to determine how far far up Delaware you would need to go uh, to make sure you didn't have too many people crammed in one place. So I felt like I wanted to share that because I learned, I learned some things that ended up not going to be in a story because nobody wants to read how crazy a bill's Super Bowl parade would be uh, after what happened in Kansas city on, on Wednesday, everything again, I, I know I'm being repetitive now, but everything changed. Uh, it's not a lighthearted feel good story. Uh, to talk about how Buffalo would do it uh, when Kansas City has done it multiple times and still ends uh, ends like this. No, no amount of planning. Uh, Eight hundred good guys with guns, with high with 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 training, uh, specialized training, and usually with law enforcement, you need to stay up on your training. Um, couldn't eight hundred of those good guys with guns couldn't stop two kids. Uh, with guns uh, in a, in an event that might see more people, more people crammed in one place in, in Western New York than outside of union station in Kansas city. I shouldn't say in Western New York, I should say, you know, you'd have the Chippewa area that would be blocked off of course on either side. So Chippewa would have no traffic going down it. People would be out in the streets there. Um, It would be somewhat, although much further extended north, but somewhat like the Gus Macker or Taste of Buffalo, the way that shuts down the end of Delaware into Washington Square. But as you mentioned, stretching as far north as Gate Circle probably couldn't go too much further than that. There aren't a lot of there aren't there isn't a lot of residential space there either. You have all those old mansions. You know, the Knox Mansion, the Goodyear Mansion, all you know, all the famous places that are now taken over by law firms and uh, construction companies and, uh, you know, doctor's offices. And uh, it's and then then the closer you get towards Delaware, it's government buildings. Yes, you do have some hotels. The Statler would be a great place. Uh, if it's open at the time, uh, if the Bills or Sabres were to win a championship to to get a room at the Statler and watch it from your window. I scouted out uh, the Turner Ramp, which is a parking garage. I took some pictures from there. That would be a great spot. Uh, but there really isn't a place where uh, there aren't a ton of places where you could, you know, you know, rent out or get a room with the exception of, you know, the, those places to, you know, to have a perch or to have a celebration. There are some high rise. Uh, there are some, um, yeah, high rise apartments. Um, you know, the Time and Tower, which would be closer to the beginning of, you know, the Fairfax House, all that type of stuff. There are apartments that line there, but um, you know, especially further north on that route. But the closer you get towards the city, the more it's just government buildings, courthouses. Um, and you know, offices, law offices and such. So that's why, you know, Coulter Bay would be a prime spot to post up. So would sidelines. Guess you can get a room at the West in there. That'd be a good place to watch it. 
uh, in the Delaware North building. Um, anyways, that's what I was working on. I was having, I was having some fun with it. I got to meet a lot of interesting people and, uh, have, I, I learned a lot, but that story's, uh, maybe for another time. Have they picked the date yet? Do we know when this championship parade is going to be going through Buffalo? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, 2027. Uh, no, I, uh, it generally happens on a Wednesday. I can tell you that sometimes on a Thursday, if you need extra time to clear off the streets, like they did in Philly, uh, the, they had, uh, they had to postpone theirs from, from Wednesday to Thursday. So anyway, that's what I could tell you about the bills parade. Any questions for me, Jonah? Maybe I didn't think of anything, uh, any that, uh, I might have the answer to, but I'm not, that's not coming to mind off the top of my head. I was just interested in how many specifics um, you, you were able to uncover and that have been determined. It, it makes a lot of sense that you break it down. That I, I think every NFL city and every professional city has to have a plan in place. But it it seems to me that a lot of people didn't know that a lot of this was already determined. That it would be decided, you know, closer to the Super Bowl or maybe Super Bowl week, what would happen in, in different sports. Um, in not that this has any bearing on it, but I mean, I did attend two championship parades in the city of Buffalo last year. Um, one being the bandits when they won the championship, went up from the arena up Washington street to, uh, I was just going to call it pilot field, but Coca-Cola field, or I think I'm blanking on what they call that place now sailing field. Um, and that was an interesting route, but much smaller, but to be able to go from the two Buffalo sporting venues and then Bennett high school, had more of a bus parade and, and cars following it going from its high school down to city hall and having that same celebration on the steps in Washington square. Um, but it's just interesting to me that even though we don't know if, or when the bills or Sabres will ever win a championship, we do know to some detail how that parade will shape up and how it will go. If it ever is a reality and happening. I wonder though, I mean, it's not so much, does a parade happen uh, because will the bills or Sabres ever going to win a championship? I'm, I'm I, if I'm a, I'm a betting man, which I am, uh, I would say it's going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, law of averages. Not that they've worked out yet, but do championship parades and things like this become obsolete? Do you have indoor events like in a convention center? where maybe you have a championship gathering or a rally, but it's done in a controlled environment. It's not out in the open uh, where somebody could get shot on the float. Uh, if something's happened where they can't control guns, do you set up metal detectors at an indoor venue? Do you just have it at the, at the stadium, have people come out to the stadium and the players come out the tunnel, just like they would. And, you know, uh, for a game, and they get up on a stage and people say things and then everybody goes home just and has have it more controlled like you would for a game uh, as opposed to an open air free for all uh, where people are bombed and well, I mean, drunk. I'm not trying to make a play on words where people are, you know, not of their right mind to begin with uh, and and uh, and. Uh, perhaps ready to even if it's to defend themselves come come pack in heat well i think we'll see the reaction from the cities that win the nhl nba major league baseball championships and how they handle uh you know security and whether a parade is a secure event or not if, if this changes the overall sporting culture uh way parades are held but i think specific to the bills um if they were to win next year and they were to have the next super bowl parade since this last one uh i just know so many people have heard so many anecdotes and from people in my life or around buffalo fantasizing about that parade or that moment and even the night of the bills winning the super bowl i mean i think it's said somewhat tongue-in-cheek but maybe not that tongue-in-cheek about people who you know, they'll say, oh, if the Bills win the Super Bowl, I'll be outside lighting cars on fire and I'll be blackout drunk for 10 to 14 business days after that. Wait, um, wait. 
10 to 14 business days. Well, I just said that, but <laughs> um, you know, you've heard people say that. And, and sure. Well, that's the people I interviewed. That's what they're saying. It was charming. Like they're looking forward to the mayhem. They're looking forward to the debauchery. Well, those quotes can't, I mean, those people don't want to be on record saying those things the moment Wednesday happened. I mean, they were saying it tongue in cheek, but um, or they're saying it just to, you know, cause that's what Bill's fans do. You know, we, we do crazy shit, uh, but crazy shit took on a different meaning on Wednesday. Yeah. Hopefully there can be a little bit of self-reflection from people. And I think a lot of people say that somewhat as a joke, but anybody that really does want to cause mayhem because the bills or any team wins a championship, hopefully they can kind of recognize the inappropriateness of that. But having the parade and celebrating and doing it together outside. I don't think Bill's fans are going to allow that not to happen. If there's not an organized one, there's going to be an impromptu one at the airport or downtown or in the streets. I mean, it's just going to exist organically. Uh, but so the it's well, better it's to have an organized one. It certainly will exist uh, organically the night of the game, wherever it is on Chippewa, uh, on hurdle, wherever. Uh, wherever people are watching the game, people are going to want to go, even if you're watching at home, if they win, people are going to want to go out. Uh, the game is early enough and the bars are open on Sundays in Allentown and on Delaware and Chippewa and all those, they'll just go down to want to go somewhere. Uh, they're going to want to be at the airport when the team comes back that Monday, they don't come back the night of the game. Like they do for the average road game. They, they have to stay in the NFL host city and they have obligations that they need to do. And they generally, they come back, you know, that Monday, excuse me. Um, so there'll be that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the team is involved or the NFL could get, or the leagues could get to a point where they're saying, we don't want our people out in the open um, anymore. There's just too much craziness. We don't want one of our employees, uh, whether it be a player, a staff member, a coach, whatever. We don't want somebody to get shot. Uh, and so we are not going to promote this event. We're going to tell our teams, you're not allowed to do this anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And there is definitely has to be a, a reckoning in multiple ways about gun violence and gun laws and things like that. But also, as you just explained, uh, the security and whether championship parades should happen or are a public health crisis, if you will, putting that many people together and being unable to secure the area. However, I, I guess the point I'm making is I think if you have an official parade, if the Bills or anything win the Super Bowl on a Sunday night and it's announced the parade's going to be on Tuesday, you, you kind of have that implication to tell people to save their partying and debauchery, if you will, for that date. And if you don't have a parade, say there's going to be no parade, it, it opens up, I think, a lot more of partying in the streets and impromptu celebrations that will happen anyways, but you you can't tell people to save it for the parade if there is no parade. Yeah, this is the point of uh, Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, where I'd like to remind everybody out there to please subscribe on your platform of choice. Uh, whether it be iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, YouTube. Uh, also, uh, comment. We've been uh, enjoying the comments uh, that have been uh, left uh, underneath the, the YouTube uh, videos. Sometimes they get a little more heated than, than others. Uh, and also, like. Like, thumb up, whatever the hell your platform offers there. Rate us. Five stars. Hell, give us no stars. No, don't give us no stars. If you're listening right now, you probably like it in some way. I guess you could be hate listening. But yeah, please please vote us accordingly, whatever it is that you think we deserve. Um, I also want to uh, promote an event uh, real quick. And uh, uh, our friends uh, with uh, Bike MS uh, have... Uh, have one coming up on May 11th uh, that you can sign up for a uh, walk MS Buffalo. Now this is walk MS Buffalo, not bike, uh, but it's the same folks. Um, come and be a part of an unforgettable display of support and love surrounding people with multiple sclerosis. 
um, and uh, go to visit walkms.org uh, to sign up. Uh, and that event is uh, May 11th. And then there is one on May 18th in Rochester. And that uh, same website, I'll give it to you again, walkms.org uh, for more information on uh, how to sign up, what to do, where to go. Uh, great event, great people. Uh, Jonah, Turner Battle is getting his jersey retired at the University at Buffalo tomorrow afternoon. The game is at 2 o'clock against Akron. Turner Battle, who is uh, one of the great recruits uh, in UB history, probably the greatest recruit Reggie Witherspoon uh, ever had there. We can have that discussion. You may know a name uh, or know somebody who's better, but that's my pick. Uh, and I back when I was covering uh, UB uh, very early in my time at the Buffalo News, um, Turner Battle obviously deserves it. And uh, he, uh, those years were when the the UB Bulls got closest to making the NCAA tournament before Bobby Hurley became the head coach. And uh, of course, Turner Battle was uh, uh, the catalyst uh, for those teams. What are your what are your memories of Turner Battle? Well, I Turner Battle's career at UB, uh, you know, I wasn't covering the team by the time he had graduated and he was gone, but he had come back and been a assistant coach. I think the first time I met him and talked to him and wrote about him, he was assisting at Sweet Home, which is where Reggie Witherspoon had coached and played prior to coaching in college. And then he moved on to helping with Reggie Witherspoon, assistant coach at University of Buffalo, and later on, uh, down at Chattanooga and um, I'm drawing a blank on the other schools he's worked at, but he was a UAB was another one where he was a, an assistant division one assistant coach and kind of rising and, and perhaps considered somebody who would maybe be a head coach someday at UB or a Buffalo school coming back. And that didn't happen. He's now back in Buffalo as the athletic director at the park school and not in coaching and, and stating that he d doesn't really want to coach anymore, that he's kind of in a different phase of his life uh, with his wife and kids who his wife is from Buffalo, from Williamsville, and, and they've kind of settled back in Western New York. And within that, he's become a color commentator and working on the broadcast for UB ESPN plus games, um, which is nice for UB fans. It's nice for him. It's nice for the people that have gotten to know Turner. Like I got to know Turner battle a lot better seeing him at the Gloria Parks Leagues and around town and mutual friends that he knew from playing basketball, I knew from playing basketball, even though we weren't the same type of players or the same level of play at all. We had the same, you know, mutual acquaintances in the basketball community. Uh, his wife, Claire Clowry, was a very good um, women's basketball player uh, and in the Winsville North girls basketball coach before they moved away to Alabama when, when he first left Buffalo in his coaching career. Um, so there's a lot of Buffalo basketball connections with Turner Battle, Reggie Witherspoon, the University of Buffalo. It's nice to see one of Reggie Witherspoon's players and Reggie Witherspoon's era be celebrated at UB. I give credit to George Helkovich, the new coach. I think he's uh, kind of pushed forward. He hired Kelvin Cage onto his staff, who was another player, played with Turner Battle. He, you know, he was a year behind him in class. Um, but I did want to get your perspective, and I guess what I'm circling back to here is that, you know, Turner Battle is not from Western New York, not from New York State or the Northeast. He's from North Carolina and was recruited up here and, and is the best recruit I think UB's gotten in its modern Division I era. They had a couple players, Jonathan Williams, Ronaldo Sagu, that were rated similarly to Turner Battle, and they had excellent careers, and Jonathan Williams is, you know, a, a fringe NBA player right now. Um, but didn't have the same impact on the program as Turner Battle had. And combined with the recruiting status and the career they had, I think you look at Turner Battle was the recruit that put Buffalo basketball at that point on the Division One map and in the MAC. And Nate Oates and Bobby Hurley and coaches later raised it to a higher level. But it needed Turner Battle and the players that he came in with to get to that level. And I think it's it's a nice Buffalo basketball story that he's back in Buffalo living here working in the Park School Athletic Department and able to get his number raised. It's not going to be retired. There's actually a number 11 on the team right now, and there's been other players that have worn number 11. And number 11's already hanging in the rafters for Rasan Young, who was the leading scorer at UB for a long time. I think number two or three still right now. 
Um, but it'll be a fun event to see the different former teammates and friends and family and people in Buffalo there tomorrow for Turner Battle to celebrate that and celebrate um, the history of Buffalo basketball, even if the present isn't going very well. Yeah, days. Turner Battle was a game changer, really, for UB at the time. Uh, he kind of came out of nowhere uh, as a recruit. And I, I don't mean he came out of nowhere, but the fact that UB landed him was a huge shock in the in uh, in the recruiting industry. And you're talking about all those uh, guys who do their publications uh, with the, you know, he was a, he was a top 100 prospect uh, and to go to UB at the time was a major upset. And he came out of North Carolina. Obviously a lot of eyes were on him. It wasn't as though he slipped through the cracks. He chose UB as I recall uh, in my coverage. And I don't remember what he majored in, uh, but he chose UB for academic reasons. I want to say he was an engineering major. I'd have, I'd, ha I'd have to go back and look. I mean, that's a bit of a guess, but uh, he wanted UB for the academic aspect of it and also because of the basketball. And he was academic all Mac three years uh, of his, uh, during his time in, in Buffalo. I don't think he read, I think he only played the four years. I don't think he was a red shirt. So three of his four years, he was academic all Mac. And um, he was, it was, it was uh lightning in a bottle and he, especially with the position that he played. Uh, but the thing was that really, I was a bit disappointing, not because of him specifically, but because not by anything he did is what I'm saying, but is that Turner battle didn't lead to more. Like people thought maybe this was you be breaking through in the recruiting. Maybe they got some special sauce, Maybe there's something in the in their their pitch that they're able to get these types of kids, but they really couldn't get that type of kid. He, he it turned out over time that Turner Battle was an outlier. They they couldn't get a lot of kids like Turner Battle, which uh, I think is a reason why Reggie Witherspoon didn't have the staying power because they got close. They got they got to the MAC championship game twice didn't win. And then when Turner battle left, there was obviously a big drop off, you know, where's the next Turner battle. And that, uh, you know, that was, I think why I think some in the program were a bit disappointed because that was the first bit of excitement that you had with UB as a, as a program, the, they, they got good turnout at the games. Uh, they started to come to alumni arena, uh, the team was good. They were uh, a contender in the Mid-American Conference. Again, like I said, they made it to back-to-back -to -back, uh, Mid-American Conference championship games in Cleveland uh, on national TV, the whole thing, playing for an automatic bid. But that was as close as you could get. And I think they needed another recruit or two. Uh, hell, probably one more recruit probably makes the difference because they did come close. Um but yeah, that's the thing is that Turner battle turned out to be a little bit, again, I have to be careful how I say it. It's not Turner battle's fault. The land, the fact that the UB landed Turner battle did have, did turn out to be a little bit of a tease for the program or fans of the program that maybe, maybe you could expect this type of caliber of player on a regular basis. And it, and it didn't happen, unfortunately, but that also speaks to how talented Turner battle is or was. Yeah, I mean, well, Turner Battle was, I mean, there, there's some other players that came along later, but, you know, he's in the conversation for the best player that UB ever recruited. I do think that, uh, we don't need to relitigate year by year, I do think uh, Reggie Witherspoon and his staff, Jim Quinchoff, Chris Hawkins, who's with him now at Canisius, recruited pretty well at different points in time after that. You know, they did get all the way to the MAC Championship game and win 23 games that season. If maybe they were one player away, I think a lot of uh, schools end up, especially mid-major schools, end up in that regard. And what happened with Reggie Witherspoon at UB, there was a, maybe a bit of a lull after Turner and his class graduated. And then they came back very well with, you know, Mitchell Watt, who's who was a MAC Player of the Year and had a tremendous pro career, and Javon McRae, who's the all-time leading scorer, and he's, you know, had an excellent career outside of post-college playing overseas. Um, but at that point, they were also maybe one player away and even one year away from breaking through and having success. 
But all of that set the stage. There were a lot of Reggie Witherspoon recruits on the team that won the first MAC championship uh, with Bobby Hurley as the coach. And Nate Oates and his recruiting and Brian Hodgson being very involved with that took UB basketball recruiting to another level. But Reggie Witherspoon and his assistants in that era had gotten UB to a higher level that was a stepping stone for the success that UB had later on. I'm going to look this up. Uh, I did find uh, he was uh, the Sports Information Directors uh, Association, the national group of, of college sports information directors. Uh, had Turner Battle as academic All-American as a junior with a major in communications. Now, I know he did not enroll at UB as a communications major because I remember, obviously, uh, something different, as I mentioned. So I'm going to look that up. Well, that's um, the degree he's using. He's, he's in television, broadcasting, uh, doing some work there at UB right now. And, uh, you know, being an athletic director is an education job and, a, and an athletic sports management job. But I think there's communication skills. Uh, I like to, you know, you and I both teach communication classes at different colleges or have in the past. And there's a lot of, I think, uh, you mentioned on our last podcast how you don't need a journalism degree to do journalism. But I do think communication studies and journalism degrees prepare you for a lot of different lines of work, especially in education and maybe being an athletic director. And not that this happened with Turner Battle, but there's a lot of athletic directors, general managers, Brandon Bean being one, they start as sports communication, sports information interns or low level staffers. And that is kind of an entry point towards getting to higher levels of sport management and athletic administration. Right. He has a master's degree from Canisius in sports administration on top of it. Um, I can't seem to find it in here, but I know he didn't. I I remember it being, I want to say it was engineering or some sort of bio research. It was, it was a, a U one of UB's strong majors uh, at the time. So he, he, I, unless I'm totally missing it, unless I totally botching this uh, he switched his major to communications, which is, it's just fine. Um, well, I'll ask him about it tomorrow. I'll, I'll ask him my, yeah, my, I, Wonder is if that was, uh, you know, something that lured him to UB. And then I think a lot of times with athletes at all schools, you find out that certain academic programs and certain academic schedules and rigors and majors don't align with the demands of being a Division One athlete. And not that you get steered to easier majors, but you get steered to majors that fit and the schedule aligns with what they have to do as athletes. That's probably even more the case now than it was 20 years ago. I see a Bob DeCesare column uh, that says uh, he's mulling. He's This would be from 2000, January 2002, so Battle's already been in the program, and he uh, communications is his answer du jour, according to uh, Bob DeCesare, as to what he wants to get into. So he was batting around, it looks like, a handful of majors. Um, anyways. Uh, somebody who doesn't have to worry about uh, picking a major just yet, although I'm sure he's being recruited pretty hard, is Bishop Timon's Jaden Harrison. Uh, he's the he's on the verge of breaking the record. Uh, is it the help me out here? I don't want, I don't want to say it wrong. Which which, which all time scoring record is it? Well, right now he's 16 points away. He's number two all time in Western New York boys basketball. Uh, career scoring record. So he's passed Richie Campbell, which was a record that stood for 27 years in the second place. And if he gets 16 or more points tonight in a big game at Canisius, Timon is the number two team in Western New York. Canisius is number one. They played a couple of weeks ago when that was flipped, when Timon was number one and 16 points tonight, he'll pass Dominic Welch, who seven years ago uh, set the record scoring for Chittawaga, went on to play uh, four years at St. Bonaventure, another year at Alabama. Uh, and two games recently with the Buffalo Extreme ABA professional basketball team. Um, but beyond that, because time of season isn't over, that this is they'll have another regular season game, uh, one or two playoff games in the Manhattan Cup playoffs, which they're the defending champions, won that last year, and perhaps two state playoff games. He's rising up the state scoring list. Right now, Jaden Harrison is in the top 25, and he's 60 – or he's 39 points away from 2,400 points for his career, which will put him ahead of Greg Paulus for 20th. Uh, 19th is Jimmer Fredette. There's some Felipe Lopez. There's some well-known names on that list, and he 
with a state playoff run, if they can get back to the state Catholic championship game as they played in last year, that would give him an opportunity maybe to be top 15 all time in the state. And, you know, he's going to get 16 points with the number of games that are left. If it doesn't happen tonight, at some point, Jaden Harrison will be Western New York's all time leading scorer for boys basketball. Uh, There's four or five girls, I believe, with more point totals than Jaden Harrison has. Uh, Danny Haskell, who's currently playing at St. Bonaventure, is the all-time leading scorer in women's basketball. Gretchen Dolan just last season got up to second or third, third, I believe, all-time. So there's been a lot of high-scoring exploits in the last four, five, six, seven years in Western New York. Is there any doubt that he gets it tonight? Uh, yeah, because for a couple of reasons. One, Canisius, Canisius is, is pretty good. good. Canisius is very good. Um, and also a good, well-coached, tight defensive team. I mean, this could be a low-scoring game. And also, you know, he's the point guard. And there's been games in just in the past couple of weeks chasing this record, but games throughout his career. He's not the leading scorer on his team. I actually believe after the last game, he might have taken this over by by a hair. But their junior guard, Nakai Harris, who's the son of former Niagara Falls Syracuse player Paul Harris, uh, as of two games ago, was averaging a slightly – higher point total than Jaden Harrison. And there's been games. He had a triple double with only 16 points last week. He had a game with only seven points because it was such a blowout. Uh, He didn't play in the second half a week ago. So I think it's very possible that even with time and winning the game, that he could have a, you know, 12, 14, 15 point nine night and set it up to maybe break the record at home on Monday at time. And, but I also believe I, you know, I've watched a number of games in recent weeks. I think he's going to probably get, 20 to 22 points as his average is. And, and, you know, I don't know who's going to win this game, but I think Tymon could very easily win this game, even though they lost at home against Canisius the last time they played. But one thing I'd like to note, and I wrote about Jaden a bit on WIBB.com, and it was a fun story to report on. And this season, even the past couple of seasons, watching him play because he was a, you know, I met him when he was nine or 10 years old at the Gloria Park Center I mentioned earlier where, Turner Battle and some guys played Jason Rowe, uh, who's the coach at time in one of the best point guards, probably the best point guard in Western New York history, uh, playing there. And Jaden Harrison, his father ran the clock and was a kind of an entertaining personality, impromptu announcer. You know, if I made a long three point shot, he'd yell from the belly of a whale. And he had different nicknames for different players that <laughs> were amusing and, and kind of fun. And Jaden was nine or 10 years old on the side dribbling the basketball or during timeouts, he'd go out and take shots. And as he got older, he kind of got to see that he was going to be a good player, a good youth player. I remember seeing him at, at young camps. And then he started playing for West Seneca in seventh grade. And there was a time at least once, if not another time where, you know, maybe my team only had four guys and we needed somebody, somebody was late and we needed somebody to fill in as the fifth guy. And he came in as a 12 or 13 year old and was able to fill in and make shots probably was better than me out there. And Jerry Sullivan wrote a bit about this for West New York Athletics. There were times Jason Rowe was playing and he had to pick up uh, Jaden on his team. And Jason Rowe comes in with a much better team. It's not just him. It's Damian Foster and different guys, uh, legends that he played with. And Jaden was even able to run up and down and, and make shots and keep up with that run as a 12 or 13 year old. And then he's grown into being, uh, he's probably going to be the West New York player of the year. He was an all West New York player last year. And interviewing him, he remembered all that. He he yelled out the from the belly of a whale thing at the end of the interview. So it's kind of nice to to see his progression from a young player. And that's that's a bit what I wrote about because so many different basketball players and coaches and referees and officials have spent time in that Gloria Parks gym, either playing or coaching summer league teams or watching, uh, working there. Different referees and different coaches have spent time there. Kevin Ferguson, a longtime Division One referee, is the athletic director over there, and he's ran that program for many, many years. Um, so there's a lot of basketball people that know Jaden, watched him grow up the same way I, I did, and I just explained that I think are having fun watching him uh, chase this record and, and get the point totals. And for a time and team that's uh, number two in Western New York, but they have a chance to you know, maybe win a state championship and be one of the best teams in the state if they finish well. Who are the top college prospects in Western New York right now? And where does Jaden Harrison fit in with that? Well, that's an interesting conversation because I mean, Jaden Harrison probably is the top 
college prospect in boys basketball. It's, it's a different conversation with the girls. Um, maybe Nakai Harris as a junior is on the same level. We'll see kind of where his recruiting goes over the summer and into next year. Um, but Jaden Harrison, who doesn't have a lot of Division One scholarship offers and a lot of um, recruiting attention right now, he's probably the best. I'm trying to think of a younger player that maybe is getting recruiting interest. And, and I can't really think of one. There's a player named Greg Brooks who started in Western New York. He was playing varsity basketball as a seventh grader. He's gone off to play in the New England prep school leagues. And I think he's a bit of a higher level recruit than Jaden Harris is, is now. And he's a junior. He's not going to come back to Western New York, but in theory, if he did, you know, he would maybe be the answer to that question, but there aren't, there isn't a Roddy Gale right now. There isn't a uh, player playing in Western New York on the boys' side that has 2025 20, major offers or, and is going to be a, you know, bona fide top ranked recruit, a Turner battle, you know, type recruit. There really isn't. Uh, there are girls players like that. There have been many girls players in recent years, um, but not on the boys' side. And a lot of that has to do with the transfer portal and recruiting and the age of the players. It's a lot harder to get a Division One offer. I think it's been a couple of years. It's been many years, really, since I think the West New York Player of the Year was able to get a Division One offer right out of high school. A lot of them have to go to a prep school. And even there's many of them who, even after a year, end up being Division Two recruits, Division Two players. Well, while trying to find uh, my story that I wrote about uh, Turner Battle, uh, I did uh, come across uh, a story uh, from he, when he signed his letter of intent written by a young Tim Graham uh, that does uh, talk about him being a top 30 point guard, uh, in, according to uh, Bob Gibbons, the legendary hoops recruiting expert, and that uh, Kentucky had shown interest in battle, as had Virginia Tech. Uh, he also received offers from Delaware, North Carolina, A&T, and Tulane. Uh, you know, you have to go back and see how good those programs were at the time. Uh, those the, na the names don't mean too much, but Kentucky speaks for itself. Um, Virginia Tech, you know, ACC program. Uh, right? Virginia Tech. ACC. Yep. A Big East at different points in time, but ACC right now. I will say one thing, like Jaden Harrison, because I've had this conversation with different people about whether he is going to get a Division One offer and sign Division One, whether he's that type of player. A lot of people believe it, it might be a situation where he has to start at one level, and if he plays well, go into the transfer portal and get to a Division One school later on. Um, but I, I think of different players that are similar. So, I mean, it's a possibility, and, and there's no shame in this. Jaden Harrison might uh, sign with Damon and be a, an excellent Division II player, an excellent Division II recruit for Damon College. And if you go back four, five, six years ago, there was a point guard out of Rochester, Jalen Pickett, who at one point in his senior year, his best opportunity was to go to Damon. He almost signed with Damon. He ends up getting a very late offer from Siena, goes to Siena as the MAC freshman of the year, moves on to Penn State in the transfer portal, gets drafted in the second round of the NBA and is on the Denver Nuggets ro roster right now. Not to say that's exactly what's going to happen with Jaden Harrison, but I think there's similar level of high school players that you know could sneak into a Division I offer at some point and, and rise to a much higher level of player. And recruiting is funny because it, you, sometimes recruiting, when you're scorekeeping it or, or saying who are the best recruiters, it's who gets the highest rated best players. But sometimes when you find the lower rated you know, diamond in the rough gems and they become – great players that's actually maybe better recruiting than just uh selling your program to the best players and another player i wanted to mention davion warren he played at uh timing uh, six seven years ago an all western new york player he wasn't player of the year he had to go to a junior college ends up going to hampton where he was one of the you know top five scorers in the nation playing there and finished up at texas tech and now he's on the um NBA G League roster for the Brooklyn Nets, their team in Long Island. So there's different ways where different players aren't Division I recruits at, at certain points in their high school and their recruiting years. Jordan Wara was a player who didn't have a lot of uh, 
Division One scholarship offers and recruiting interest coming out of the Park School. And then after his prep school year, he had a lot more and he was able to go to Louisville and now he's playing in the NBA. So while Jaden Harrison and the rest of the Western New York boys basketball players are, are not being highly recruited right now, you know, you could see some of these guys being bigger level college players and professionally, potentially even professional players later on down the line. All right, Jonah, thanks. I know you got to get out there to the game, so we'll wrap it up here. And uh, thanks to everybody out there for watching or listening to Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. Please give us that subscribe, that like, that comment, whatever it is you need to do. Um, we'd appreciate it. Have a great weekend. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions.